thing and my last bit here. This is my favorite one right now, you guys. Cherry lemonade. It's pretty awesome. Still can't figure out why YouTube washes me out so much. I don't I don't know. Like I wish you could like adjust the settings on the YouTube live. It trying to drives me crazy that it's so bright. If I change my light, turn it off. No, still washed out. It's really irritating. Wish I could fix that. I'm too afraid to click anything for fear that I'll mess it up. Let's see if there's any other. Oh, look at that. There are other options. Let's try. Ugh, they're still just overexposed when you click them. What the heck? <laughs> there you go, guys. <laughs> yeah, no, that's not going to work either. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's funny. I don't like any of them. Darn it. That's too bad. That's probably the darkest one, so we'll stick with that one. If you can even see a change, I don't know, can you? Does it even look different? Huh, this is interesting. I've never clicked on any of these options, you guys. That's interesting. Hmm. I want to see live chat, right? There we go. Okay. Weird. All right. Welcome, everybody. Good to have you. Sorry things are so weird with the camera. I have no control over it. It doesn't give me any options. I tried everything I could think of adjusting my own personal camera, like the settings before I came on here so that I could see if I could stop me being so washed out. But I think YouTube just does it because it won't let me adjust anything really at all. So dang it. Well, it is what it is. So welcome, welcome. Let me know if you're here. Be sure to say hello. I am gonna check out to see who's here. In my opinion, I say first, welcome. Nicole, Nikwina, good to see you. Love Omad from Toronto, good to see you. Hey, Teresa and Karen, I got my awesome moderators in the house, Keto Fat Girl No More and Karen Rothwell. Rachel Devonish, good to see you from Provo. We should get together. I keep saying that, but you're gonna have to make me because I'm super busy. <laughs> Ah, uh, Cher Cheryl McLim from Alberta. Hey, my kid's going up there for Easter. I think it's Alberta. I'm not sure. His girlfriend's parents live up there, so they're driving up. Whatever's straight above me, right above the, over the border. I have no idea if that's Alberta. <laughs> I've never been to Canada. Amy Kling from Kansas. Welcome. I'm sorry if your connection is bad. I hope it's not me. Anybody else struggling with their connection? Karen says over in Florida, it's not going so well. Anybody else struggling to see what I'm saying? Um, Angie from Kentucky or Angie. Angie from Kentucky. Sorry, didn't mean to get that wrong. Our life, the keto way. Amanda is here. Hello. Otimo. Not seen you before. Welcome. Uh, Alberta's above Montana, so that would not be where they're going. What's above me in Utah? They told me where they were going. It's glitchy. Dang it. We are actually about to get a storm here, too. It is a good chance it's my fault, but I don't know what else I can do about it. Um... If I put my Wi-Fi on, it'll probably be worse. I use my cell phone coverage to to broadcast. If it's really bad, we can just skip it and wait till next week. Um, keep me updated how it looks. I know it looks weird to me too, like the the color. I look like I have red eyeballs. Anyone else? Do I look like I have magenta eyes? Oh my gosh, I've got to change that back. Ah, uh, David Hyde is here. The blue, the hubby. Oh my gosh, these colors are all terrible. Why don't they have like an adjustment where you can like choose what you want it to look like? Uh, okay, I'm just going to go back to normal and I'm just going to be boring and washed out. Sorry guys, because I don't want to look really creepy. All right, I don't want to skip. Yeah, I don't plan to skip unless no one can hear me otherwise. <laughs> it's no point. I'm sorry it's blurry for a lot of you guys. Dang it. Um, 
Yeah, let's not talk about storms. It's making me cry. Apparently, it was 70 degrees yesterday, and we played outside, and we laid in the grass, and we fed the chickens, and the kids jumped on the trampoline, and tonight it's going to snow until Thursday. Why? It's just rude. It's just rude. Uh, pit, but you can still hear me even though the picture sucks, yes? I don't know why the picture is so bad. All right, well, if it kicks me, if it might kick me. So let's just try it. And if it ends up being really terrible, I will do the same subject next week. But I just want to make sure that we talk about this because it keeps getting brought up. Okay. All right, well, if the audio is good, that'll just have to be good enough. All right. So everybody, motivation. I keep getting a lot of um, comments from people basically saying, I wish I had your willpower. I wish that I could be so determined like you. I wish I could be so motivated like you. I just, I keep falling off the wagon. I just can't seem to get the willpower. And I wanted to tell you guys, honestly and truthfully, that willpower is a myth. It does not exist. It's not a real thing. I don't have a superpower. I am not better than anyone else. I am not stronger than anyone else. I am not more determined than anyone else. Um, the key to willpower and the key to staying on a weight loss journey um, is comprised of several things. And I didn't discover any of those things until I was pretty close. Well, I mean, I did, when I lost weight six years ago, I did find it a little bit. And six, seven years ago, I guess it was seven because Ruby just turned six. So yeah, I have had two weight loss journeys that were successful in my life. And during the first one, I did start getting a little bit of a, an idea of what those things are that help you be successful and help you continue on. Um, life happened and ended up gaining it all back plus 40, ending up, of course, as most of you know, close to 400 pounds and desperate. So... I have now come around the other side and I have made it two plus years into my journey and I thought it would be good to talk about why I've been able to stay on it for so long, how I've been able to be successful and what like fixed that issue for me because I mean obviously my whole life I was only 42 when I finally figured this out or well, accidentally fell into it and began figuring it out. And why did I yo-yo? Why did I struggle all of those years before? So some things I have learned um, about willpower, okay? <laughs> willpower is just a thing that people use as an excuse. That I don't have willpower, so I can't be successful. Honest and truth, there really isn't any such thing as willpower. Willpower is combined for, for several things, and the number one being... Um, motivation, as in the very first thing that triggers you to want to lose weight. What's the thing that made you jump off the diving board? What's the thing that got you excited? What's the thing that got you motivated at the very beginning? It's just like with any anything in life, any um, challenge, any goal, any you know achievement. There is an it, an it, there is an initial motivator that pushes you to start. Okay. So number one piece of willpower is your initial igniter, your first spark, your first flame, okay? What was the reason you got started? So most of the time people will go along willy-nilly saying, yeah, I need to lose weight. Yeah, I want to be thinner. Yeah, I want to be more healthy. But they don't really feel that push to start. So once you feel the push to start, that's step one. And getting to that place is different for everybody. Um, for me, it was just honest, honestly fear. It was fear. I was afraid that I was not going to be able to take care of myself anymore. I realized that I may not be able to get myself out of the tub by myself. That I may not be able to clean myself by myself. And that I was going to have to either have help from outside sources or from my children, which was horribly devastating and the thought of that was very very powerful and it was probably 
my main spark for getting started. And it's a pretty strong one. The stronger your spark is, the longer it's going to burn, right? I mean, the more the more powerful that initial push is, the more likely you are to be propelled forward into your journey. So if you're having trouble finding that initial spark, that's a soul searching thing. You really have to sit down and think about why, why do I want to be healthy? What is my main reason behind it? For me, it was fear of embarrassment, fear of be, not being there for my kids, fear of death, fear of a lot of things, but fear was my main one. Now, should fear be your motivator? It's very motivating. It doesn't always have to be your spark, but whatever it is that is going to propel you into your journey, it has to be pretty strong and you need to find it. So people call it finding your why, what's your why? I don't want to be too cliche, but you need to find the thing that convinces you that losing weight is imperative, that it needs to be done. Or, and it can be positive. It can be, I just really want to run a marathon. I just really want to fit into that bikini. It has to be something you really, really desire. If it's positive, it has to be really strong. It has to be really much there. And if it's positive, it helps to put it on the wall. I wouldn't suggest putting your fear motivator on the wall because that's likely to pull you back to that place. Um, but if you're having a positive motivator, like wearing a certain size or fitting into a certain outfit or um, any kind of reward that you feel like that you are going to get from this, you can draw that or put a magazine article out or whatever, write it down big and put it on the wall. Um, and that can be your motivator every day by seeing it. So no, step number one to willpower is your initial spark. Now, just like with a love relationship and just like with any other big idea that we have in our lives, the spark cannot be the only thing that keeps us going on our journey. That's just impossible. You know, a spark will shoot up a flame and the flame will grow really big for a minute, but then over time it's going to fizzle back down to coals. And if you want to keep those coals a burning, you have to have more than just the initial spark. So step two is finding, I don't want, I don't know exactly what to call it. I haven't really talked about this before. To me, it's more like patience, um, but it's your longevity, your slow release burn, okay? Finding the thing that helps you to be calm about it, to trust the process, to relax about it. Um, you'll go through a lot of stages in this journey, one of, one of which will be um, worry and fear that it, it will never happen. Worry and fear that it will take too long. Stress about the fact that last week you lost five pounds, but this week you gained three and you're like panicking and thinking it's not working. Second guessing yourself. All of those mental games that your body plays with you, that your mind plays with you, you have to find a way to push them to a relaxed, patient level where you just kind of go along even keel. Um, one thing that's nice about keto is it seems to give you a lot more control over that. There's a lot less yo-yo and there's a lot more calm feelings on keto. Um, especially as you become fat adapted four to six weeks in when you really start getting that mental clarity and focus, it's really, really easy to find your zen, okay? so. Step number two is not about being strong or keeping the fire burning or staying super motivated. It's the complete opposite. I know what it is. I just thought of the word acceptance. Okay. Step two is acceptance. Acceptance that it's going to be slow. Acceptance that the scale lies. Acceptance that it's not always going to work acceptance that sometimes you're going to get stalled, acceptance that it's going to take a long, long time and that that sucks when you think about it when you're at the beginning and that it feels overwhelming. All of these things, it's learning to accept that this is your new normal and that this is the path you are now on is the key to staying on plan. And so you, you have to start with your why but your second one is just acceptance that you don't have control over everything and that 
They always say, trust the process. There's so many cliches. Find your why, trust the process, okay? Those are actually true things. I don't like calling them that necessarily just because so many people use that, but it's honestly true. Any kind of endeavor, you're going to get to the point where it's work. It's not fun anymore. The scale has petered out. It's just no fun. And you have to be able to convince yourself that this is okay, that it's okay to accept that it sucks, but that you're going to keep going, okay? The third thing that's going to happen to you on your journey is where everybody stops. And I, when I say everybody, I mean everybody. I don't know anyone that's ever been successful their first time around. This is not an easy thing to do. Losing weight is not easy and it is all mental. They say it's 80% nutrition, which is true, but it's so much here, so much here. It's these games that you play. You will hit a wall, okay? At a certain point in your journey, for me, it was probably, gosh, oh, probably six-ish months in, you will hit a mental wall. You will come up against this brick wall and go, ugh, this process is so long. I don't want to do this anymore. This is so hard. This can't be my life. Why do I have to keep doing this? All of these thoughts will come into your head. I can just eat blah, blah, blah thing because I've done this for so long and it won't derail me or I don't deserve to be successful. I mean, I don't know. There's a million things your wall could be. But the key is, is knowing that it's going to happen. So first, your spark, second, acceptance, and third, facing the wall. And with the wall, it's just your Atreyu moment. You know, you've heard me talk about being a Treyu and walking up and looking yourself in the mirror, accepting who you are and walking through the wind, through the mirror and just accepting you as a person, that's your wall. It's going to be facing those negative feelings, facing that complete and utter dreary, weary feeling and just saying, oh, well, we're going on, we're going on and we're just keep on going. Once you can do that, you will be successful for the rest of your life. P- pressing through that first wall is all it takes. You'll hit wall after wall after wall. You'll hit negative after negative after negative. It's not easy peasy going forever. But once you've done it once, it's so easy to do it again and again and again. Just like it's so easy to eat keto tomorrow and the next day and the next day after you've had so many days behind you of doing it. You do get to a place where it just becomes what you do. And if you keep telling yourself that the scale does not matter and that you don't need to worry about what it says and that you can just relax and enjoy it and enjoy the ride and just accept, well, it doesn't matter what the scale says because this is what I'm doing for the rest of my life. That's how you keep going. It's not super willpower. It's not super determination. It's not strength even. It's actually the opposite of strength. It is peace, acceptance, and just keep putting one foot in front of the other. And that's literally all it takes. Willpower is a myth. It does not exist. It's not really a thing. And every time people say, oh, I wish I had your willpower, I think to myself, you need to have my peace. It's not willpower. It's about acceptance. Acceptance that this is how it needs to be for me to be healthy, whether I make it to my goal or not. I actually had someone comment, I think it was yesterday or the day before, someone commented, I think you're just afraid of hitting your goal. And so you're trying to delay, you're trying to like delay the inevitable or whatever. I can't remember exactly what she said. Stall, I think she said, trying to stall because I'm afraid to meet my goal. I really don't even like, I don't even know what to say to that because it's so ridiculous. I'm not afraid of anything but regain. That is still in the back of my mind, very, very scary and causes me extreme anxiety. The only thing I'm afraid of is going back to that place that I never, ever want to go again. That's it. Um, Getting to my goal. Am I afraid of getting to my goal? Why? Like, I don't know. Plus, my goal changes all the time. I've already got to my goal. And that's kind of why I like to take breaks because I'm enjoying it a little bit. I got to this place where I never thought I would get and I want to enjoy it a little bit of time before I move to the next phase. I don't think that there's anything 
weird or whatever. I think people just want to see me meet my goal. And so they're impatient with me. And you know what I feel about, feel like about that? I just, I really don't care. I really don't care. This is my journey. I'm choosing to share it with you guys. I'm choosing to try and help the rest of you to get on this path of peace and acceptance with me and enjoy it. But I'm also like, I'm on this journey for me and it's about how I feel and it's about my life and my success and what I want to do. <laughs> and so I like when people say, say stuff like that, I'm just like kind of rolling my eyes. And I thought, why didn't you put that on your assumptions about me, on the assumptions about me tag so that I could say that one in my assumptions video. So yeah, and if you haven't, by the way, if you're all here, 50 of you, if you're not following me on Instagram and you haven't posted an assumption about me, do it. Yesterday was so dis depressing and disappointing because I like posted it and I got like one assumption in four hours. And I was like, this is embarrassing. This is extremely embarrassing. So if you haven't done it, go do it because I want to make a really good video about assumptions. And there are some really good ones on there. And there are some that made me laugh a little bit. And there are some that I'm like, I wish that was how I am. <laughs> so I'm excited about doing that video. All right, that's all I have for the discussions. So if you're here for that, if you're watching this later, you can go or you can just listen to us chat. I'm gonna go back and see if there are any questions. So if you have any questions about anything, it can be about this or it can be about um, anything at all, about me, about keto, whatever. Post your questions. Also, don't forget, um, you can super chat if you want me to see it right away. It will give me a notification that you ask a question. I'll make sure I don't miss it. Um, but yeah, anyway. And of course, we appreciate the donations, Dave and I, because it helps us keep this channel going. All right, so let's see. Um, I'm glad the picture is looking a little better. That's awesome. Oh, Jennifer, I think that the, the weather will calm down by the end of the month for the low-carb con conference. I think it'll be okay. Usually it doesn't get too crazy like this. Usually once we get into April, it's rain usually, not snow. So irritating. I think maybe it was just because I put that filter trying to make me look less washed out. I think that was what was wrong with the picture. So I'm just going to not do that anymore and apologize. Guys, I need to wear like bright red lipstick or something so I don't look like I'm half dead. I really feel like there is no contrast in this video. And it's worse since I got my new phone, which is weird because, I don't know, you think it would be better. You think it would be better. All right, let's see. So yeah, what are some of your motivations for getting started? Terry Lee says, um, good health, looking good is just a plus. That's true. That is true. And because you don't always look as amazing as you think you're going to look when you get there. Like my reality of what I look like now, when I, when I look at myself in the videos of my ballet class, I'm going to my ballet class again tomorrow. When I look at the videos of me compared to the other moms in the group who are much thinner than I am, I still feel like the big girl in the group. Even wearing a size 10, eight, 10 or 8 pants, depending on the brand, and size medium top, I still feel like the big girl in the group. So, yeah. It doesn't always look as awesome as you thought it might look when you get to a certain place. But, also, I just find that I don't care as much as I thought I would about that. I'm not letting it stop me like watching myself in the video thinking wow I'm a lot bigger than the other girls doesn't make me embarrassed or make me not want to come to class. I just have accepted myself so much more and I just am okay with where I'm at and how I feel. So I guess I've really changed mentally. Like I've really come 360. Now do I have my moments? Heck yes. Chef Dave will tell you I have had an absolute complete and utter meltdown this week. Uh, well, actually, it was last Wednesday. I freaked out. And ever since I freaked out, I've been struggling with some depression, which hit pretty badly a couple of days ago. I think it was Sunday, Monday. I can't remember. I think it was Sunday. I just got into this funk. And it's. I know there's no reason for it. There's no reason for it at all. Literally none. It's just 
I have no control over it. And that's another thing I've accepted is my depression. So instead of trying to come up with a reason of why I, why I feel sad, Dave's asking me a million times, you know, not a million, but a few times, like, what's going on? Why are you sad? Is it to do with the kids? And really, I just stopped trying to figure out why. And I just said, if there is no why, this is just depression. And I just need to get through it. Like, I need to accept that sometimes there's no why. And I don't need to blame anybody or anything for the sad feelings. I just have to, like, feel them and find a way to move through it. I'm still a little struggly. I'm not... 100% back to my normal, which really sucks because I don't know if it's food triggered. And then I start to question what I'm eating and look at all the new foods that I'm eating and see which one it could be, which I don't want to go there because I'm really happy with my choices, as you guys know. So, yeah, it's a lot. It's, I'm still playing mind games. I'm still playing mind games with myself. That's just kind of how it is all the time. I don't think I'm ever going to be like totally happy and calm and fine all the time. I'm, I've never been that person, you know. I don't think any of us are. I don't think any of us are. Um, Jennifer Costa, I am glad that I helped you today. Um, I woke up very, like usually I'm struggling every Tuesday not knowing what to talk about. And I woke up from a deep sleep this morning knowing this is the subject that I was talking about today. So if it was for you, I'm happy to help. I don't know exactly why I needed to talk about this today other than someone needed to hear it. So there you go. Oh, Teresa, I didn't see your Instagram assumptions. I'm going to go look that up. I'm going to put one. I'm going to put one for you because I know how it feels to not get any. It's so embarrassing. Yay. All right. Okay. Good question. This is off our topic, but it is keto related. And it is a question I get quite often. How do you manage to keep track of a meal when it's a casserole? I get lost when I do one. Okay. Number one, that's 90% of the reason why you hardly ever see me eating a casserole because <laughs> it's a pain in the butt. Number two, this is how you do it. Okay. If you go to most of my recent recipe videos, the, especially, I think I talked about it in Hamburger soup, I talked about it in, or cheeseburger soup, I guess it was. Uh, the zucchini nuggets, I think I talked about it in that one. But in chronometer, if you go to my foods, there is an option for adding a new food. But if you scroll down, there's actually an option for adding in a recipe. And this is how you do it. As you're building your casserole, as you're building your recipe, you will weigh each ingredient put it in the recipe, and you will enter it into a recipe in chronometer. Then at the end, it asks you if you want to divide it by division servings or weight servings or how many servings, things like that. And you can determine how you want to do it. I usually do it by weight. So it keeps the weight of all of the ingredients. But the problem is, is that those are the raw weights. And then when you cook it, it changes the weight. So if at all possible, I weigh my recipe again after I do it. And that's where it gets tricky is that you, you can't really put that in chronometer. So you have to basically divide the whole recipe by how many servings you decide you're going to have and then weigh out only that amount in the, of the casserole. Like I said, it's a total pain. You will probably have to write that down somewhere. Um, if you're going to do it in a baking pan, you're going to weigh the pan before you put the food in the pan so that you can subtract the pan weight from the weight of the actual food. If it's a soup, it's a little easier because you can just pour it into a big container. But if it's a casserole, you have to have weighed out the pan. It is a royal pain. Is it worth it? Yes, because you really do need to track if you're on fat loss. If you're not on fat loss, you can guesstimate it. So for example, when I when I did um, the cheesy mac and cheese recently in the last couple of weeks, what I did is I took the recipe and divided the amount by sixths in my head and I tracked each, each thing in the recipe because there was only a few things. There was cauliflower, there was cheese, there was cream cheese, there was um, heavy whipping cream. And I think that was it. I think that was oh, bacon bits. And so I took those five things and entered them separately into chronometer and a sixth of what the recipe called for. And then I just chopped a sixth of the pan. You can do it that way, but it's not going to be as 
guaranteed to be as close. So that is how you do it. If you want more, of course, more details, go to my recipes playlist and watch some of those because I do show how I enter it into chronometer and I do complain about how annoying it is when we're doing it. <laughs> All right, I see I have a super chat, so I am gonna find that first. Gloria, thank you so much. This is an egg question. I want to buy a large amount of farm fresh eggs since it's a distance to get them. How long do your eggs last in the fridge before they're considered too old? Great question. Nicole could probably help with this question as well. Um, I First of all, I don't keep eggs in the fridge. I keep them on the counter. My farm fresh eggs, are they last a really, really, really long time. Um, I am not sure how long exactly, but I'm guessing multiple, multiple weeks, um, especially if they weren't washed with soap and water. So when I get my eggs, a lot of times they're covered in bird poop and feathers and crushed eggs because sometimes they're stupid and they smash them, which annoys the crud out of me. I'll tell you, it annoys the crud out of me. I hate that because they get all nasty. What I do is I actually, you can sandpaper them or I use like a metal scrubber and I scrub most of the gunk off and I rinse them with cold water only. You don't wanna wash fresh eggs with hot water because if there's salmonella on the outside, it can go through the shell. And it's best not to wash them at all. So if they aren't dirty, I don't wash them at all because it keeps the cuticle on the outside um, safe. And once the cuticle is safe, they can last for a long time. Um, if you've had them for more than like a month, I would float them before I eat them or crack them into a separate dish before I eat them. So you can tell that an egg is no longer fresh by its weight. Some I am to the point now where I can pick one up and know it's not good. They're very heavy, especially the ones, the farm fresh eggs are very, very heavy. They're solid, okay? In fact, I bet you they, they completely weigh different if you weight them on a scale um, a month apart they kind of lose their weight and I don't exactly know why and as they go rotten the yolk sac will actually break so if you break one into a dish and it's just liquidy even if it doesn't smell bad don't eat it because it won't taste good it's not like bad to eat but it will taste gamey it will taste off you can know when you have one that's a little off because they taste a little off um but that's how I tell is if I know I've had them for more than a few weeks, I will put them in a tub of water. If they float up to the top, don't even crack them. Just throw them away. If they float somewhere in the middle, it's iffy. Crack them into a bowl and see how they look, see how they smell, and decide for yourself. If they sink to the bottom, you're golden. If they sink and they float with like, they, they're touching the bottom, but they tip up a little. They might be on the edge. Use your own best judgment. But there's no like set time. There's so many variables. Um, I don't know that keeping them in the fridge can help, but I suppose it can extend the life. I never do that. Just never have. Um, they just last a really, really, really long time. So, yeah. Like... Dave says, oh, Dave says up to three months on the counter unwashed, but would check them after a month. So yeah, that's kind of how I go. Also, if it's sunny outside and I either haven't collected the eggs or like we find a random stash that we don't know how long has been there, if they decide they're going to lay some random place, which they sometimes do, um, those ones make me a little ner more nervous. I'll eat those first. And I try and rotate my eggs. So I keep the newest ones on the bottom and try and eat from the oldest ones first. So that's kind of how I do. Also, I try and sell them um, before they get weight to that point at all. So like if I feel like I'm stacking up, I'll post them for sale and try and sell them really quickly because I don't want to, I don't really want to extend past a month. I just really don't like to. I have, but yeah, then you have to worry. <laughs> so don't crack them into anything unless you're sure. I hope that helps. Thank you for the awesome question and for the super chat. I appreciate it more than you can know. I'm very, very grateful. All right. Let's see where we were. Um, Terry Lee said, I looked slim and pretty in the ballet video. Thank you. <laughs> it's hard because like 
I wear, I wear, like the first two weeks I did that new class, I wore a squeezer and I felt like I looked really a lot thinner. And then last week I didn't wear a squeezer. And then I was worried that when I put out my new one, you haven't seen that one yet. When I put out my new one that people are going to think I got fatter because I didn't wear the squeezer because I don't know where I did with it. Can't find it. I don't have it for tomorrow either because can't find it still. It's in the laundry somewhere and I have so much laundry. Yeah. Okay. Pinky Pink says, I don't honestly know what my motivation was. And I think that she meant her initial spark. I hated how out of control I felt and knowing that I was just going to get bigger and bigger. Yes, the control thing is a big one. The, when you're eating carbs and you get so hungry that you feel like your stomach is eating you from the inside out, it, it, it's very stressful and it makes you feel out of control. That's one beauty of keto that will help you right away if you haven't started is that within two weeks, your sense of control over what you eat is huge. It's huge. That's a huge motivator for me to stay on track as well. Teresa says her motivation is to be around for her granddaughters. Yeah, exactly. I don't even have grandkids yet. I need to be around for a long time. I want to see my nine kids get married and have beautiful babies and enjoy Christmas dinners together and take them for sleepovers and shopping sprees and whatever else like my mother-in-law does. I want to be healthy and capable and be able to go to all my grandkids' ballet recitals and, you know, singing things and concerts and whatever else they just, just do in their lives. I want to be around too. That's for sure. Angie said, my motivation is just to feel comfortable in my own skin and live by example of being healthy for my son and family members. Yes, having so many daughters, that one is also huge for me, especially as I see my daughters struggle a little bit with their weight as young kids, just like I did. It makes me happy that I have been able to set the example of being healthy and that my youngest ones, that's all they remember. They don't remember the big mom. They don't remember the the not able to do things with me mom. And my ones that do remember the big mom cherish the moments that I am in their ballet classes with them. <laughs> they appreciate it and they never want me to quit. And they're good motivators, I'll tell you. It's, it's, it's a beauty for them to see me caring about myself enough to take care of myself and setting the example of that it's never too late, that it's never too late. Even, you know, as an old mama of nine, I can still pick up the pieces of my life and do something and do something about it. That it's not too late. It's never too late. Uh, let's see. Karen Rothwell said her last month was really rough. She was dealing with car insurance and PTSD, dealing with the, um, she, she had like a lot of stuff going on car accidents and everything. But she said she did break keto a couple of times because of, the stress but got right back to it because she's very motivated for it to be a lifestyle so that's the thing is she didn't beat herself up and seriously that is the biggest thing stop stop beating yourself up girls you're all worthy of success and you're not you're never a bad person even when you make a bad choice even when you choose to go off plan that's not a reflection on you as a person it's just a thing you decided to do that's all it is. It's only a choice. And when you stop giving choices control over you, that's when you get the power. That's when you get the power. You're in charge. When you realize that choices don't reflect upon you as a human being, that they are just things that you chose to do for the day and tomorrow you can just move on, that is like half the battle. It's half the battle. Good job, Karen. I'm proud of you. <laughs> I would love to get together with Karen again. She lives in Florida. I'd love to go back. Ah. Karen says she weighs her pan empty and then again when it's done cooking. That's that's what I would recommend doing for sure. And then divide it by the amount of servings you're planning to have and then weigh those out and then write it down somewhere so you know um, how much each serving is going to weigh. And then you can freeze it and just have that much every time. Um, okay. Tony Riley says, I love how you're doing this for you and being honest. You look so healthy. Thank you. Um, I feel like I'd be 
pretty honest with you guys, even when people are negative. And I have to say, though, that compared to other YouTube channels, you guys are the best. And I hardly ever get any negative comments. And when I get constru constructive criticism, I do really contemplate that and think about it a lot. Um... I don't always agree, but I do think about it a lot. And I do still struggle with depression when people criticize. And that's why I was really nervous about the assumptions thing, because I'm so afraid it'll send me into a depression. But you know what? I need to learn to cope with those. And I have. Like, I've been depressed all week, and I have eaten the exact same amount of food every single day. I haven't gone nutso, gone crazy eating tons of fat. Like, I ate the exact same amount that I decided to eat. So that has been really good. All right. Have I ever tried intermittent fasting? I'm stalled and trying to find a breakthrough. Um, I do have a whole live chat video if you want to search um, my page. I really wish I was more organized with the live chat videos. I think I need to go back through there and add those to playlists so that you guys can find them. I do have one on breaking a stall. Has lots of tips and tricks on how to break a stall. Um, yes, I have tried intermittent fasting. Technically, I'm still doing intermittent fasting. I'm just doing it with three meals instead of two. I'm still trying to eat in the eight-hour window of intermittent fasting. Um, I've been doing IF since about a month into my journey purely for convenience sake. Did it really help me with my weight loss? I cannot say because I never really have hit a stall that I didn't plan. In fact, even when I've planned to have a stall, I've never actually had one. I've never actually stopped myself from losing until this last month. And until I get to June to see how much water weight comes off of me, I won't know for sure if I succeeded. So I'm not hit a stall, a true stall. So for me, a true stall is not one week of water weight gain or even four weeks of water weight gain up and downs. For me, a true stall would be six weeks with no change on the scale, no change on measurements and no change in pictures or clothes, how they fit. So far, I have yet to meet all of those criteria at once. So is it really a stall is a question that I answered on that video and what to do about it. Yes, intermittent fit fasting can definitely help. I feel like intermittent fasting definitely helps you stay in your caloric deficit better. Um, it keeps your carbs low because there's only so much you can eat in two meals. And eating the two meals, I just feel like was really beneficial for a lot of things, giving your body a break from digesting eliminating the amount of insulin, like Karen Rothwell told me, insulin responses, the more often you eat, the more insulin responses you have. Keeping those insulin responses down can help. So yes, if you're not already doing it, I highly recommend trying it because it can definitely help. It definitely is. And it's what I've done almost entirely from the beginning. Not intentionally because I wanted the benefits of intermittent fasting, but just because it was convenient for me to only have to worry about food twice a day. Now, I found that I really want in, in maintenance to have those three meals. But I, like I said, I'm trying to eat between like noon and eight and one and nine. Like I'm trying really hard to stay in that window the best I can, even with three meals. And I keep my meals three to four hours apart still. And I make sure I'm eating 30 grams of protein per meal minimum still. All right. Um, good question. Can I talk about how my faith got me through my weight loss journey? I feel like God brought this to me. I've lost 40 pounds with 70 more to go. Yes, I have actually talked about that a lot on my channel, especially since last February when ketogenic dieters fired me and I felt so alone and so lost. Um, first of all, when I hit my spark, my spark was fear and the first thing that I did was fall to my knees and beg God over and over to help me escape my prison. I felt like my body was a prison and I begged him day in and day out for an answer. Keto was my answer. He gave it to me right away. I only, I think I was only on my knees groveling for a couple of weeks before I found the answer that I was looking for. But he didn't expect me to just take keto, lose the weight and run with it. He gave me a calling to teach it. He gave me not only the calling, but the ability to teach it and the desire to teach it. And through that desire to teach, 
I have found even more peace and even, even more acceptance and even more ability to keep going on the journey. Believe it or not, helping other people and knowing that other people counting on you is extremely motivating and it really does help keep me on this path. And he shows me signs all the time that I am heading in the right direction. And it's made it a lot easier for me to keep going, knowing that it's what he desires for me. And knowing that me getting to that scary place had a purpose because he wanted me to be able to understand and have empathy for you. And he wanted me to be able to know exactly what it feels like to lose 110 pounds and gain 150 back and how hard it is to go out in public when you feel like everyone is staring at you or what, how hard it is to go out in public when you feel like everyone is not able to see you, which was worse. And all of these feelings, these horrible negative feelings that I went through, the depression, the struggle, all of those things were given to me as a gift so that I could understand you and that I could be in your shoes and feel what you feel and tell you that it's possible and give you the motivation to go and do. Because without him, I could never have done it. Absolutely. I 100% credit God to my success and to my continued peace and acceptance on this journey. And I know that Teresa feels the same way. And I know a lot of you guys feel that way, that God has brought us together and that we're here together for a reason to be a family and a community for, for each other of support and love and to share it with everybody else. I kind of feel like I'm the, I'm the keto missionary <laughs> kind of thing. I'm out there to preach the preach the good word of keto. I've never been that great at preaching the good word of God. I've always felt nervous talking about my testimony and my belief in him and my struggles and all of those things. I've always felt like talking about God and those things would make people uncomfortable. And I didn't want to push people away. But I found that the opposite was true. The more I started talking about my feelings about God, the more comfortable other people feel. And I didn't feel like anyone that didn't believe in God was put, put away by that or put off by that or was any less motivated to lose weight. So I've been really grateful for that journey as well. It's really helped me in my spiritual journey. So there you go. That's the answer. <laughs> Thanks for asking. Ah, see, Teresa, she said the same thing. I love it. Oh, go back to Florida. It's like my dream. Karen, someday I will, I promise. Rhonda says, OMG, you have nine kids. You look like a child yourself. It's the YouTube filter. Look, I have wrinkles. I'm 44. I'm 44. I had my first kid when I was 21. He's 23. Yeah, my youngest is three and one of them is adopted. But yeah. I never, ever wanted a big family either, you guys. I didn't even want any kids at all. <laughs> God led me to that too. And then sometimes I'm like, what were you thinking? Because I am not the best mom. I'm not the best mom. <laughs> but I do my best. I try. I really try. And I apologize to my kids all the time. And I let them know, hey, you know what, guys? Nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect. And I'm doing the best that I can. And you can call me on the carpet for crap. I need to change if you need to. I'm cool with that. And yeah, I overreact and yeah, I scream and yeah, I have emotional breakdowns and I've had depression and I've put it all on you guys, but let's chat about how that can be better. <laughs> That's kind of how my talks are with my older kids. Um, my younger kids, it's a little different, but yeah, similar to that. I always make sure I apologize when I'm stupid and I'm stupid a lot. <laughs> uh, let's see, Rebecca. Atrimi says, I know you have your first meal late in the day often. What's your average fast time each day? I'd say probably nine hours. I've been 15 and nine pretty much my whole journey. I try really hard not to eat before noon. And sometimes I do if I'm really hungry. I kind of go by how I feel in the morning, but I try really hard not to eat until well into the afternoon. So between noon and two-ish, but more likely noon and one. So that my second meal can be about four o'clock when I'm at the dance studio, which is where I really get antsy and bored. And I'm usually alone because the other moms don't always stay. And I just bored. It's, I just really hate not having anything 
to eat at the dance studio, which is why I'm doing that now. So I try and eat noon and four and then around eight. That's my optimal. Sometimes I get home too late. Sometimes we just don't get around to it. Sometimes I eat a little earlier, but I try really hard to space my meals three to four um, hours apart for muscle protein synthesis so that my um, muscle protein aminos can do their job and still keep building my, um, you know, muscles and all that. And I don't have as many insulin responses as if I were to eat snacky all day. So I make sure I eat all of it at once within an hour, but usually within 20 minutes. I try really hard not to spread it out at all. Um, and I have defined meals that I've decided what to eat, even here in maintenance where I'm eating treats. My treats are still planned. They're still tracked. They're still at the, the right time and together with protein. So then I make sure I have that protein that I need for muscle protein synthesis. Um, it's definitely holding me in a holding pattern. Whether I'm putting fat on or not is still left to be seen. I may have my calories a little too high. I really hope not because I really feel comfortable with this amount of calories and anything less than that really makes me feel deprived at this point because I just don't have as much body fat and my body complains. At the beginning, I could eat 1,200 calories a day, no problem. My body was comfy. It had lots to burn. Now I find the closer I get to my goal that when I eat those fat loss macros of under 1,300 calories, my body feels sucked dry. I just feel like my body is nervous and it doesn't want to do it anymore. Now I can force it to do it. Of course, I can tell my body what to do. I do it all the time. I still don't eat when I'm hungry or intuitively. Still two plus years. I don't trust myself to do that. I will way overeat if I do that. I still stick to the calories and macros that I have allotted myself and I am eating them at the times that I told myself to eat them. I don't eat all the time unless I'm super hungry in the morning. Then the sometimes I'll start earlier. But because of my schedule, I cannot eat usually before 8 p.m. I just don't get home till at least then. So I have to be careful that way. So yeah, that's basically where it kind of stick. Ah, uh, that's amazing. Sweet, sweet tea and Teresa both had similar experiences with God helping them find, find keto. And I love it. I love it. So, so wonderful. Hey, Angela, ADH Snuggles is here. Glad to see you. Um, Karen said she found low carb earlier, which was really keto, but she didn't know about electrolytes and the weakness made her quit. Yes, that's, an, that's the reason I think that I have my electrolytes soapbox where I make so many videos talking about electrolytes and where I basically like, that's where I hard line it. That's where I'm like hard nosed and not nice. If you're going to do it, do it responsibly. Take your electrolytes. Don't feel like crap. If you feel like crap, don't blame anything but yourself because you didn't do your electrolytes correctly. If you are having 5,000 milligrams of sodium per day, minimum, 300 milligrams magnesium, not oxide or citrate, every day, minimum, and you're getting at least 1,000 to 3,500 milligrams of potassium from food or light salt, minimum per day, you will feel better. And if you're not doing that, you cannot, no one can hold you responsible for your failure on keto or you're feeling like crap than yourself. And it's the most frustrating thing. People never believe me, never believe me. In fact, the guy that I was coaching on keto, it's kind of frustrating because like he would send me his macros every day and I give him advice every day, but he never once actually hit the macros the way I set them out. And he did not choose to do his electrolytes. And after three weeks of not losing weight, he said, ah, I'm out. And I just kind of was like, well, there's no one to blame but yourself. You didn't do it the way I said to do it. I tried to be patient, but you didn't do what I asked you to do. And so that's why you didn't have success. It's not that there was a failure in the plan. It's that you failed to follow the plan. <laughs> so, yeah. Make sure you get your electrolytes. And, of course, I have a million videos on that. In fact, live chat a couple weeks ago was avoiding the keto flu. Go back to that one. All right. Oh, that's horrible. Teresa says she remembers once walking into her, walking to her car in the Walmart parking lot and a carload of teenagers oinking at her. That's so mean. Why do people, why are your kids so mean? 
kids are so mean. I had a ser similar experience in junior high. So I started packing on the weight around age 10. And by the time I was in seventh grade, I was, I think, 135 pounds. I definitely was not thin and I definitely was not tall yet. I was probably, I'm guessing, 5'4 ish, 5'5 five, five ish at that weight. And I wasn't like, I was super huge, but I remember walking into homeroom and the kids going, boom, 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 as I walked to my seat. It was mortifying. And that was the, the day I knew that I was fat. Like, the, the day I thought I was, but the day I knew that I was, was when someone else told me I was. And for the whole rest of my high school career, even when I get, grew three, four inches between ninth and 10th grade and looked amazing at 150 pounds and, and five foot seven, I didn't even know that I was gorgeous because I had thought I was fat because that's what I was. I was fat. So sad. It's so sad. Why do kids have to be so mean? People wonder why I homeschool. It's stuff like that. It's stuff like that. Kids are still mean in homeschool. And I still, we'd still deal with a lot of problems, even in our own families of kids saying stupid things like that. But it's, it's a little bit easier to control than sending your kid to school. So that's part of the reason why I do it. Um, Terry Lee says, my meals and breakfast has helped you so much. Awesome. And thank you for your prayers. My breakfast is awesome. I love it. I love it. Ah, good question. W. Kip asks, is Chef Dave a real chef? By profession, no. Chef Dave is a mechanic. <laughs> he can fix a mean car. He's also a supervisor. He supervises the fleet at our local water company and keeps us in the clean water. He's awesome. Um, he loves cooking. He loves barbecue, especially. He has an actual barbecue catering business that he does on the side. So I guess technically he qualifies as a chef now. Um, they do like they cater big parties and things like that. They do pulled pork and fries and things like that. So, yes, he does have technically a chef business. Um, he started cooking for me when I sunk to a really horrible depression about 11 years ago when I was pregnant with my sixth child and I could not function as a human being. And he stepped up and started taking care of me. And it just kind of became a thing that he did. And I can't seem to like I can cook. I just don't enjoy it. It makes me very stressed out. Just like I can clean the house. I just really don't do that either much. I hate it. It makes me miserable and it triggers my anxiety. And I, I don't exactly know why, but it does. And so he is kind enough to step up and do that. Is it always easy? No. Does he always love it? Definitely not. Um, but he's willing and I appreciate that. Um, he makes separate meals for me and the kids and for himself. So he makes a minimum of three meals every single night. And that is a lot to do with the fact that I go to the dance studio and I'm not home every single night. So he he goes ahead and does the shopping most of the time. I do so, sometimes do the shopping and I try really hard to do menus for him and so that it, he doesn't struggle on what to choose to make. But for the most part, at night, he does cook our family meals and my meal for me while I'm editing videos because he's awesome. <laughs> and because running two YouTube channels, doing photography, having nine kids and doing homeschool is no flippity flapping joke. <laughs> it's hard. It's really hard. <laughs> uh, Rebecca says, thanks for the meal info. It helps so much. I've really struggled with the, with Dr. Berg's intermittent fasting recommendations, but your meal schedule seems more realistic and flexible. Yeah, it works. And, I, and Dr. Berg, I don't really listen to anything he says most of the time. I mean, he has some good info, but for the most part, I stick to Dr. Finney. And don't look at Dr. Berg very much for most bowl reasons. So there you go. Oh, Karen, that's horrible. She says she was so weak from lack of electrolytes when she was doing low carb that she got up to try and eat a banana, but she was so weak she couldn't even open the banana. Wow, that's crazy. Emma Stone. I'm not exactly sure who Emma Stone is. I'll have to look her up, but thank you for the compliment, I hope. I hope it's a good thing. <laughs> Oh my gosh. All right, guys. Hey, look at us at exactly 59 minutes. Oh my gosh. Before we get to the trolls joining us. It's always nice that when you get trolls, though, because that usually means 
that your videos are being seen by people on YouTube that aren't normally seeing your videos. So welcome to trolls, even though you're going to get deleted. Thank you, Karen. All right. Anybody else have one last question for me before we go? Or are we going to be done? I can't think of anything right off the top of my head that I wanted to mention other than just, you know, keep going, you guys. You got this. Got this. We all got this. But if I can do it at 44 years old with nine children, homeschooling, running two YouTube channels, anyone can do it. Anyone can do it. You just need to find your acceptance. <laughs> Okay, severe constipation. I will answer that really quick before I go because that one is a big one and it's one that needs to be dealt with pretty quick. If you're struggling with constipation, your problem is electrolytes. It isn't fiber. It isn't too much or too little fat. It is sodium and magnesium. Okay, so magnesium citrate will flush you out but I don't recommend it all the time. It's good for getting rid of constipation, but it isn't best for daily supplementation. You do need to supplement daily. I personally supplement 650 milligrams of, of glyconate, magnesium glyconate every single day. That helps with muscle relaxing, helps with sleep. If your energy is your problem, you need malate. And I have no idea what oro is for, but I heard it's good but I don't know which one it is for. Oxide is not super absorbable, so avoid it. It does work, but you need large, large doses of it. Sodium is likely your issue, and I guarantee you if you go and take 2,000 milligrams of sodium, which is about a tablespoon and a half of, yeah, about a tablespoon and a half of sole water, or, oh man, I'm gonna have to do my math really quickly, 21, seven, quarter teaspoon, seven grams of actual pink salt in a container with water. I think that's right. Seven or eight grams, something like that. And you down that in 20 minutes, you'll go to the loo or the restroom or whatever you call it. Trust me. It will flush you out. If you're not normally doing that amount, if you're normally doing that amount, it'll take double that to do anything. But if you're normally doing that amount, you're not going to have that problem. So there's an article over on vertahealth.com about why you don't need carbohydrates to live. That one has a lot of information about why we don't need fiber. It's all this sciencey stuff about how ketosis creates butyrate and butyrate is what fiber rotting in the gut creates, which is why we need it for good digestion. So ketosis prompts good digestion. And as long as you keep your electrolytes in balance, you will go just fine. You'll go less often every two to three days, more likely, because there's just less waste, especially if you're doing whole foods keto and you're not eating a lot of bars and things. If you're just doing whole foods, you're going to go less often. But as long as it's normal when you go, then it's not constipation. If you're struggling with horrible constipation and you really want to flush it out, go get some magnesium citrate and some sodium down it and stay home because you will get flushed out. I guarantee it. All right. Okay. Um, you could put your assumption in the comments of any video. Yes. Um, if you're not on Instagram, um, you can, I may or may not see it. It's best if we keep it all in Instagram if you can, but yeah, like if you want to put your assumptions about me in the comments of this video or any other video, just make sure you put, this is for the assumptions video. Cause I'm making that over the, over the next three days, I am going to be doing like a few each day and then I'm going to be editing and posting the new Tammy's tidbits with the assumptions Sunday for my, um, oh wait, no, I, maybe I'm not. We have a competition this weekend. Okay. That's my plan, but whether or not that's actually going to happen is left to be seen. Cause we do have a big, huge competition in Provo, Utah this weekend at the Provo something center, UVU center. No, not UVU. Dang it. Some downtown Provo place. Anyway. If you want to meet me over there, that's where I'll be all day Friday and Saturday. If you live near Provo. Um, anyway, my plans is to put it up on Sunday for my Patreons. So if you guys aren't a Patreon and you want to support this channel, I'm really grateful for the, anything that you can donate. Um, it's just taken out on the first of the month. It's just a small donation towards keeping my channel going, keeping me from murdering my... <laughs> 
husband or myself. I don't know. Like it's just money is stressful. You know, money is stressful. And my Patreons get to see Tammy's tidbits and recipe videos 24 hours before everyone else on YouTube. So it should go live on Monday if I get it done for everyone else. So head on over to Patreon. The links in all the videos, link to the Facebooks and all the videos, the link to my Teespring stores and all the videos, except this one probably because I never quite get around to sticking all that in the live videos because I'm so busy on Tuesdays. All right. That's all I have for you. I am going to take my leave and thanks so much for hanging out with me and having such a lovely chat. I hope this inspired you to get back on the wagon if you're not on the wagon and to remember to help you find your peace and your acceptance so that you can be successful in your own weight loss journey.